Hello mate, thanks for clicking on this video. You're watching Video Game Subscription Wars, the channel where I cover every game on every game subscription and today we're back. We're back with the best PS Now games and it's been a while, longer than I realised in fact, so I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but we're back with a bang. Today it's the best open worlds on PS Now, after that came out on top in a recent Twitter poll. Uh, it was a tight fought contest with the winning result getting a massive five total votes. If you like a tweet or two, follow me on Twitter, but if you want a say in which genre I cover next, the best thing you can do is let me know in the comments down below. I'm thinking potentially online multiplayer or story driven, but I'm open to suggestions. So whatever you want to see next, just let me know in the comments below. But first, let's look at the big wide worlds PS Now has to offer. And to be honest, we're spoilt for choice here. The only distinction I want to make before we get started is the difference between a true open world game and a sandbox or hub world. Games like Bloodborne, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Dishonored and Uncharted give you the freedom to explore large environments that often contain side missions and collectibles. This gives the illusion of an open world, but it's more like a series of large interconnected levels. And in the case of Bloodborne, I can't get past the first level anyway, so I can't do much exploring. I've also reviewed these games in some form already, as is the case with all of these games. They won't feature in this video, so go check them out in other videos in this series if you want, and I'll meet you back here in about 10 minutes. Well, we, we should probably get started without them. Yeah, they, they can pause it. I've also decided to rank these games in order to mix things up a bit. So here are my 18 best open worlds on PlayStation Now, from worst to best, starting with number 18. The side-scrolling action and adventure of the original Castlevania games literally defined a genre, or half a genre, at least, but its transition to 3D has seen mixed results. 2014's Lords of Shadow 2 is the third Castlevania game for the PS3, and the most recent entry in the series. It's also the first to include an open world, albeit a constricted one. You trek back and forth between a handful of locations with next to no reason to stray from the beaten path. The openness feeling like an unnecessary addition in a time when open worlds were a trend as much as an intentional informed design choice. As for the gameplay, it's a run of the mill hack and slasher that just didn't do it for me and honestly it lost me by the end of the prologue. If GTA is the pinnacle of the open world, Saints Row 4 is probably the closest replica on this list. The city of Steelport is crammed with things to do that you can do whenever you want. I just struggle with the actual game and I think it's because Saints Row 4 took the tongue-in-cheek humour of Saints Row 3 into the realms of stupidity. I know a few people disagreed with me when I slated it in a previous video and I'll admit I didn't explain myself much. So I'll try to do a better job here. Let's start with the premise of the game. You become the President of the United States, aliens anally probe you and put you in a 50s sitcom simulation. You break out by swearing and blowing things up to be put inside a simulation of Steelport from the previous game. Eventually, like the full 10 hour length of the game later, you break out of that simulation, kill the alien and become leader of the alien race. And if you've done all the side missions, you can go back in time to save Earth like nothing ever happened. The open world is pretty good, I just don't want to spend any time in it, and I think that's important, so it's near the bottom of the pile. From what I've read, Rage was the best looking game of its time. Unfortunately, that time was 2011, and while the level of detail remains pretty impressive, that sense of awe has faded. Perhaps it's my personal disinterest in the pasty brown wasteland aesthetic, but I think this is a game that leaned on its visual quality, and there's little beneath that. Rage is a standard shooter with solid gunplay, but I rarely felt compelled to deter from the main storyline. The, the LEGO games fall into the hub world branching into several levels formula, even if that hub world has become progressively larger over time. LEGO City Undercover is the only truly open world LEGO game where Chase McCain hunts down the criminals of Brick City. A dense and charming world is the best example to date of Traveller's Tale's mastery at transforming the real world into one made entirely of bricks. This is the first LEGO game that isn't based around an existing property like Star Wars or Indiana Jones though, and because of that, 
it becomes painfully clear that this is a game made for kids. This is a game made for kids too, but the fact that it's Star Wars makes me feel like it's still okay to play in my 20s. I'm still hyped for the Skywalker Saga and you can't take that away from me. You can almost forget. After a 15 minute prologue, you're free to go wherever you want in Dead Island. You probably won't uncover much for doing so, apart from additional supplies and weapons, but the option is there. There's not much need to go wandering though, as Dead Island's huge number of quests will take you to every corner of the tropical turned terror induced resort. There isn't huge variety, most take the form of collecting a thing or saving a person, and slashing through plenty of zombies on the way. The melee combat has no frills, it's just swinging your weapon around like a lunatic, but it's good fun, especially when you, when you chop their limbs off. <laughs> The Tales franchise has actually been around for 25 years, slowly building a western audience. This is the 15th game in the series and was one of the first big JRPGs to hit the PS4. Bandai Namco has found its footing in that time. Don't expect Tales of Zestiria to veer far from the well-trodden path of sprightly youth gets caught up in a battle of good and evil and embarks on a journey of self-discovery. So I'll slot it in with the other 90% of anime storylines. <laughs> The game's setting is more original though, its open world a departure from previous games and a huge positive. The cell shaded 2D art style creates some fantastical landscapes which can be a little sparse, sometimes rewarding your curiosity with little more than a couple of chests, but it still makes this entry in the series feel like a grander adventure. The biggest criticism of Mafia 2, which is also on PS Now, was its world design. Empire Bay, a fictional mesh of New York and Detroit, looks very open and alive and pretty, but you, the player, exist only within a tiny segment of that world. Developer Hangar 13 had a clear idea then of what Mafia 3 needed to do to improve on its predecessor. Indeed, New Bordeaux, a fictional analogue to New Orleans, is bigger, prettier and more alive. You could even say it's more open, but more than anything, it's a disappointment. God. It is pretty though, and at times captivating. The first few hours introduce the stark racism buried into the city, forcing you to experience Lincoln Clay's struggle as a black man in 1960s America. It does not shy away from a very sensitive topic to its credit, and by the time the pieces were lined up for Lincoln's revenge story, I was locked in and loving it. The biggest problem is that Mafia 3 completely breaks down when the shackles come off and you can actually explore its world. Explore isn't even the right word, Despite the scale and beauty of New Bordeaux, what you can actually do is very limited. Essentially, every mission is the same. Find a mob hideout, shoot everything in sight to alert the mob boss, and shoot him too. That's it. You've just sampled all the gameplay variety Mafia 3 has to offer. But after you've taken down three mob bosses, you're told you've got to do it all again ten more times. New Bordeaux turns out to be nothing more than a pretty painting that you walk past to and from your way to work, but you work in the sewers. I ended up just driving around like I was on holiday, feigning ignorance of my apparent need to kill 80% of the city's population. Based on all that, I think Mafia 3 is probably too high on this list, but it's here because its world is stunning and technically open. You just don't do anything in it. That makes the disappointment so much worse. There is a great story and a good game in here, but only in the first three hours. Mafia 3's biggest strength is its construction of a world where racism is present and feels very real. It's ironic and very unfortunate how little freedom you actually have. If you ever played the Dynasty Warrior games back in the day and enjoyed them as much as I did, and you enjoy games of the Monster Hunter mold, Tukiden 2 is probably for you. Most games on this list so far use an open world to encourage exploration. Tukiden 2's open world is unique because its giant map provides more space for the core gameplay mechanic, which is bashing the shit out of giant monsters. Random encounters, side missions and everything else happen organically, making the feedback loop of gain XP, get new gear, fight bigger monsters very smooth and satisfying. It's not the most details of worlds visually, but the combat more than makes up for it. It's worth mentioning that the open world is restricted to the single player mode. If you're monster slaying with friends, you'll do it through the mission select route of previous games. Number 10! <laughs> that was stupid. I'm going back on my word a little bit with this one. 
Yakuza 5 has five separate stories spread across five separate areas, and you can freely explore each, but you move from one to the next linearly. I think it's fair to call the game open world though, thanks to Yakuza's variety of distractions. You can play Virtua Fighter in an arcade, you can bowl, you can bat, you can fish, you can play cards, you can play air hockey, you can play pool, you can go out on dates, you can go out to dinner, or you can serve some dinner up yourself. The size of the open world might not be huge, but the amount of time you can spend in it equals that of a game twice its size at least. And in those games you can't go to a karaoke bar, or have dance battles in the street, or play a handshake minigame. <laughs> This game isn't for everyone because I think how much you get out of it is tied to how creative you're feeling. Just Cause offers the tools and the freedom to be as wacky as you can imagine. There is next to no story, character development, really anything supporting that. It's an open sandbox world to the extreme. If you're looking for a living world like Grand Theft Auto, a story like Shadow of the Colossus, or action like Uncharted, well, you're playing the wrong game. Don't criticise it for that. Just Cause is intentionally different to those games and the developers know it. They sacrificed those things so you could tether an enemy to a helium balloon, tether that to a tank, add some rocket thrusters and just enjoy the show. The Elder Scrolls Oblivion is available for your sprawling single player needs, but if we want to go bigger, there's the Elder Scrolls Online. The number of areas in this game is immense, each with its own side quests, missions and dungeons providing hundreds of hours of content. While the MMORPG format limits the visual fidelity and focus story that you find in Oblivion, the world definitely feels bigger. I don't know if it feels more real though, probably because your quests are constantly interrupted by other players cutting you up, or the fact that I'm talking to John Cleese and Dumbledore. Of a distant battle. If you prefer to explore open worlds on your own, Oblivion still holds up really well today. Remember the pasty brown wasteland aesthetic that I didn't really like in Rage? Well, Fallout New Vegas takes that to the extreme. The post-apocalyptic wastelands of Fallout aren't pretty. They're not supposed to be, being a wasteland, but that takes a lot of the joy out of traversal. Thankfully, the settlements you move between are far more detailed, and the Las Vegas Strip in particular still has a faint buzz about it. And connecting it all is probably the best overarching narrative in any Fallout game a quest for revenge that hinges on a three-way power struggle, giving you complete control over how it plays out. Infamous 2 gives you an open world and all the tools to bend it to your will. You learn a range of electrified superpowers to give you an edge in combat, but your core movement powers are there from the start. It doesn't take long before you can scale drain pipes, boost over rooftops and grind along electrical wires. Free running might not be quite as smooth as Assassin's Creed, but it's much faster, and you can traverse the world rapidly, constantly on the lookout for the next thing to do. That won't take long, as it's loaded with missions, side quests, and hidden collectibles. The sequel has added variety as well thanks to user-generated content. Sucker Punch included a sophisticated creator tool that, if you're willing to take the time to learn, provides huge potential for both creativity and replayability. I'll admit there isn't a huge amount of exploring to do in The Phantom Pain. Time that I've spent in the game's world is primarily moving from one mission to the next, with occasional pit stops at Mother Base. Thanks for that, boss. Come on. Thanks for that, boss. In Metal Gear Solid 5, exploration makes way for invention. It's up to you how you approach an enemy base, engage hostiles, and complete the mission. Take out guards silently and safely without being spotted or hide in a box and get transported to the epicenter undetected. Or stick a picture of a bikini model on the box and watch everyone drop their guns and just go like Ugh. Call in an attack chopper, send in supply drops, add a teleport function to your prosthetic arm. Add force lightning to your prosthetic arm. Turn your prosthetic arm into a rocket launcher, you, you get the idea. You could argue all that variety is in the gameplay, but the fluidity in which you can switch up your playstyle is dependent on the game's open world design. I've played like 20 hours, and I know I've barely scratched the surface of the different ways to mess around with the mechanics of Metal Gear Solid 5's world, and that fact routinely brings me back for more. I'm including Spider-Man knowing that it will make this video out of date when it leaves PS Now on the 7th of July, but I mean, how can I not include Spider-Man? 
This is the best looking version of New York I think I've ever seen in a video game, made better by how awesome it feels swinging through it. It's even better than I remember web swinging in Spider-Man 2 on the GameCube. Sure, if you put the two side by side now, it's kind of obvious which is better, but man, I love me some Spider-Man 2 back in the day. I do want to mention that the game's limited time on PS Now has left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. On the one hand, three months is plenty of time to finish this story, and once you're drawn in, it's probably the only thing you're going to play for a week or two. But when there are so many games on PS Now, that time limit feels tight. Maybe I'm just salty because I didn't finish it and now it's too late, but I'm just not sure why it's leaving the service. The game is almost two years old. I mean, is it still doing numbers in traditional sales at this point? Maybe they expect a boost now that the sequel got announced, but hopefully it will come back to PS Now permanently when Miles Morales comes out, but I don't know. Anyway. The Arkham series offered a progressively bigger slice of Gotham with each title, but it's the middle child, not counting Arkham Origins, even though it is on PS Now, that's the best rendition. The jump from the Asylum to Arkham City was huge for the time, giving you a massive range of side missions, collectibles, and challenges all neatly embedded into your role as Batman. Grapple Hook upgrades essentially gave you the power of flight, letting you soar above Arkham City's skylines. All of the characters, which are 90% villains, are true to the comics and bring the city to life, with so many more hinted at through easter eggs and secret locations. I don't want to get shade thrown at me in the comments, so I'll accept that if you're more of a Spider-Man or Marvel fan than a Batman or DC fan, you can swap these two positions around. Uh, it's hard to call for me. The Dark Knight spawned one of the most iconic villain performances ever shot Christopher Nolan into the directorial elite and is recognised as one of the best films of all time. But it don't have that emo dance number though. Genuinely both these open worlds are fantastic, I think Arkham City just edges out Spider-Man in terms of story. The Sinister Six is cool, Doc Ock is cool, but the Joker poisoning Batman with his own blood, using Clayface as a Joker clone, then losing the antidote at the end? That shit is crazy, man. We'll see if Spider-Man Miles Morales can top Batman Arkham Knight later this year. Well, you guys will. Uh, I probably won't because it won't come to a PS Now until 2023 and I'll have 12 hours to play it before it leaves the service, but you guys have fun. How to describe Terraria? It's 2D Minecraft. The two cursor modes clearly work better on PC than on console. There's no guidance beyond a basic tutorial at the start and the learning curve is really steep. Just why have they done it this way? It makes so much more sense in Minecraft. Those were my first impressions of Terraria. But if you can stick with the game through the bumps in the road, the same way you can stick with the bad jokes in this review, you'll find yourself in awe of Terraria's scope, much like you're in awe of my comedic talents. Knock knock. Oh wait, you can't. Uh, never mind. Terraria's world is procedurally generated, so that automatically earns it the award for most open world on this list. It's very difficult not to draw Minecraft comparisons, especially when so much of the game has taken clear inspiration. The mining of materials, crafting of items, and day-night cycles. So too is the game's tenant for unbridled exploration with the addition of bosses that you'll encounter if you tunnel down, left or right for long enough. And that's before you thought of the possibility of going up. Terraria will always exist, at least in the same breath as Minecraft, and the cynic in me thinks it will always exist in its shadow. While Minecraft may take the crown for unlocking your creativity, Terraria's level of progression and pendant for perpetual discovery is unmatched, and I know that the amount of hours I've played do not do the game justice because I just found a clip of someone fighting a giant worm and probe droids with a lightsaber. In this list, we've had games with empty open worlds, games with 100 things to do, games that sacrifice story for sheer scale, and games that offer careless abandon. But only one effortlessly blends them all together. Red Dead Redemption is the perfect marriage of story, gameplay, and world design. Missions do involve an element of follow this friendly NPC to a waypoint or follow this hostile NPC to a waypoint, but from a distance. But that's what you get from a Rockstar game. Linearity in missions met with unlimited freedom everywhere else. The Wild West is a perfect backdrop to this. 
getting drunk and playing poker in saloons, saving people from random kidnappings, finding bandit hideouts, searching for buried treasure, hijacking a runaway train. I know I've listed out things to do in a lot of these games on this list, but for me, Red Dead has the best selection. Just the number of hours I spent playing poker in this game alone, I mean, honestly. And the best thing about Red Dead is, win or lose, there's always a solution. Seven high straight, he's beaten me again. Oh, oh I can't believe next that. Hand. Well, that didn't this go This is like well. the third game in a row he's beaten me. I can't afford this. Do you know how many animals I have to skin to Be get this money to together? glad to take the coin from you, pilgrim. Ah, uh, no, okay. Enough of that. I've had enough of your cheek, mate. You know what? You've taken enough money from me. Come here. Come here. That's not how we do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a thing or two about poker etiquette, okay? You're lucky I can't reach my equalizer. Shut up. Now, you're going to stay here and you're going to think about the consequences of your actions. Okay? And only then will I untie you. Oh, d uh, don't worry about this guy, by the way. We're, don't worry. We're good friends, actually. We're, we're cousins. This is just a game we play, you know. You know how it is. Um, I'll, I'm going to untie him uh, right now, actually. Don't, please don't. I'm going to untie him. He's learned his lesson. This is a... Uh, it's just a joke we have. Oh, no. oh god. Oh god, no. I was trying to press square. Oh, Jeremy! So that's it. Hope you enjoyed that video and agreed, at least mostly, with that list. Like I said, there are a couple of open worlds that I boycotted to save repeating myself. So if you haven't seen previous videos in the series, make sure to go and check them out right now. Thank you so much for watching guys, uh, please leave a like on this video if you like what I just done did right there, and leave a comment down below telling me which genre I should cover next, and I just might do it. And it will be a lot sooner before I do another one of these, I promise. Thanks so much, see you later.